Welcome aboard the Lincoln train. Here, through the use of light and sound, coupled with the magic of electronics, we'll travel back to that memorable moment in history when President Lincoln came to Gettysburg. Time is late afternoon, November 18, 1863. Our train left Washington at 12 noon and came by way of Baltimore to Hanover Junction. And we are now on the last part of our trip to Gettysburg. We are pleased that you could join us. This train only has four coaches, and we have numerous dignitaries on board. Of course, there is the president, his personal secretary, Mr. Nicolay, and his aide, Colonel John Hay. There is also Secretary of State Seward, and Secretary of the Interior, Mr. Usher. The Postmaster General, Mr. Blair, the French minister, Mr. Mercier, and even the Italian minister, Mr. Bertinetti. Several groups of soldiers and officers from various military groups and the Marine Band have joined us along the way. And as you may have seen at the station, several newspaper men have joined the presidential party. They'll take down the speech by Mr. Everett and President Lincoln's remarks tomorrow. The weather has been quite pleasant, and this part of the Pennsylvania countryside has been spared the terrible destruction of the war. But let us work our magic a little further. Let us join these people. Listen in, you might say, to the events as they took place on this trip over 100 years ago.
Well, we have arrived at the end of our journey. Let's use our electronic magic to see the events that took place on those memorable days at Gettysburg. The president rode to the home of Judge Wills on the town square. His home still stands today and is a museum dedicated to President Lincoln's now famous words. After a reception for the president, Pennsylvania Governor Curtin, tomorrow's main speaker, Mr. Everett, and Secretary of State Seward, the president retired to his room. He wanted to be alone with his thoughts and to finish his speech. Lincoln was to give two speeches in Gettysburg, although one is hardly remembered today. A crowd was to gather outside his window later this evening, and they would ask the president to speak, and he would address them briefly. After refreshing himself, he started the memorable task. He had jotted down the first thoughts of his address at the White House earlier. Now he set about the task of completing his few remarks for the widows and orphans at the dedication of the cemetery. It was a long task, for the president was troubled with many thoughts. His son's illness, the pressing matters of the war, the decision whether to run for re-election, and his message to Congress, which must be completed. Later, he would consult Secretary of State Seward about his speech, and then retire for the night. The next day, the president and his party rode in the procession to the cemetery. Although the reminders of the terrible battle four months earlier still remained everywhere, the residents of Gettysburg and the many visitors turned out for the day. After Mr. Everett's two-hour speech, the president gave his brief address. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers... Yes, these were the words which would become a masterpiece of American literature. The world will little note nor long remember what we say here. Lincoln's statement that the world would soon forget what was said here was far from correct. His speech of 265 words, delivered in 135 seconds, will never be forgotten. For today, the world remembers very well what was said and done here. Today, it is a shrine dedicated to those who gave their lives for that great cause. It stands as a great park with monuments erected by the state to honor their own war dead. Even those who remain unknown have not been forgotten. And above all, the world remembers President Lincoln's words, which are perhaps the greatest expression of American ideals. That this nation, under God, shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth.